started working at a pizza place in downtown Hanahan. They wanted to get part-time jobs to help supplement their income. Instead, they would become victims of a terrifying attack. It seemed like a really grotesque form of torture. He tried to make them suffer. I was certain he was going to kill us. And the ensuing investigation would lead detectives on a nationwide manhunt for a serial killer hellbent on revenge. With every murder he committed, he felt like he was getting even. This would rank right up there with the worst of them, if not the worst. December 4th, 1985. It's another quiet night in the small town of Hanahan, South Carolina. Until a little after 2 a.m., when an injured man stumbles into the police station on Yeamans Hall Road, covered in blood. The dispatcher on duty sees this guy come in, and from the looks of his wounds, it's clear he's been in some type of shooting. I think there were three or four gunshots to his head, as I recall. Because of the gunshot wounds, he was bleeding profusely. As you might imagine, a very dramatic scene. He'd been shot in the head, straight into his mouth. They immediately notified the police units as well as the fire and EMS, which was right next door to us. Paramedics quickly arrived to administer first aid. In addition to his injuries, they noticed two other strange details. As they're working on him, they realize the shirt he's wearing is actually a pizza delivery uniform, and it looks like he'd been tied up. He had a piece of phone cord wrapped around his wrist, where apparently he'd been tied up. They immediately get an ambulance to transport him to the hospital, and the police officer hops in the ambulance trying to reassure him and find information. It's obviously difficult for him to communicate, but he was able to tell them there was a robbery at the pizzeria where he worked. He had managed to drive his truck about a block from the store and then had managed to stumble into the police department on foot. I have no idea other than that, that was God's will for him to make it there. Officers are dispatched to the location where they encounter a disturbing scene. The door was open, the lights were on. It was in disarray in a certain areas, uh, particularly the office and behind the counter. There was blood all over and the phone cords had been removed. It looked like the aftermath of a robbery. The cash register and the safe were both open and the cash was gone. They also find a second victim in the back of the store. It was another young man in the same uniform as the first victim. He'd been shot in the head and he didn't survive. He was tied and bound with a telephone cord and he was uh, deceased. From their driver's licenses, police are able to identify the two unfortunate pizza shop employees. A pair of 24-year-old men named Gary Melky and Christopher Zare. Chris was originally from Oakley, Kansas, and Gary was from Moorhead City, North Carolina. They were both raised in very supportive families. Chris and Gary were pretty close friends. They had been in the service together and known each other for many years. After Gary and Chris completed their naval training in the 1980s, they'd both been stationed in Charleston, South Carolina. Back in the 1980s, we had a big Navy presence in the Charleston area, and Gary and Chris worked at the Naval Hospital. And basically, the Naval Hospital treated Navy people and their dependents. They probably weren't making a big wage doing that, so they wanted to get part-time jobs to help supplement their income. They both started working at a pizza place in downtown Hanahan. Chris helped make and deliver pizzas, while Gary worked his way up to assistant store manager. It's probably not the kind of job two Navy guys are looking to turn into a career, but it paid the bills. They're working really late hours to make ends meet. By all accounts, they were just outstanding and upstanding citizens. But it seemed their part-time jobs had put the two men in the wrong place at the wrong time. An armed robbery has left Chris dead and Gary on his way to the hospital in critical condition. And investigators are combing the store for clues. Basically, there was no DNA known at the time. You could do blood samples and you could do fingerprinting and those kind of things. We had Charleston County's crime scene unit come over because they were really well equipped to process the crime scene. Fingerprints were gonna be hard to isolate there because every customer and worker probably left prints there, but they did come up with one crucial piece of evidence. 
one of the bullets had, had exited the head of one of the victims. And we went back and up under the counter, we found where one had stuck in the wall and we dug it out. It was a 25 caliber weapon. Based on the evidence, it appears the thief had entered the pizza parlor around midnight, just before closing time. The assailant probably waited until they were the only two people left in the shop and then pulled a gun on Gary and Chris. Well, since Gary was the assistant manager, he was forced to open the cash drawer and the safe. Someone with a loaded weapon was able to get Chris there and Gary Malky on the floor, proceeded to use the phone cords that were available there in the, in the business to tie them up. He tied both of them up and then ransacked and then took whatever he could, primarily the cash. I think that was over, a little over $1,100 had been stolen. Any hope they might have had that their assailant would take the money and run quickly vanished. The robber apparently decided not to leave any witnesses, so he shot Chris in the head at point blank range. I can only think what Gary Malky was thinking. Obviously, he knew he was going to be next, and he was next. Amazingly, even after he was shot and left for dead, he was able to stay alive long enough to get to the police station. But will Gary survive long enough to identify the killer? Coming up, police discover this isn't just a robbery gone wrong, but something far more sinister. The entire case it just had tremendous shock value. Detectives in Hanahan, South Carolina, are investigating a shooting at a local pizza parlor that has left Chris Zare dead and Gary Melke in the hospital. They were both shot execution style. Chris died instantly, but Gary was somehow able to survive. ER doctors work quickly to stabilize Gary's wounds. He'd been shot four times in the temple, the jaw, the base of his skull, and his neck. It must have been touch and go for a while. One of the officers went with Gary to the hospital. Once hospital workers cleared his mouth of blood enough for him to talk, he asked if he could describe the shooter. To their surprise, Gary says he knows exactly who shot him. A recently hired fellow Domino's employee named Mitchell Sims. Gary was screaming in pain, but he was able to give a pretty good description of Sims, including the color of his hair. We contacted the store manager. And he came to the scene, and he pulled Mitchell Sims' application and provided it to us. According to his records, Mitch was a 25-year-old part-time employee. He had not been working there very long. When investigators contact Mitchell's family, however, they learn he has a checkered past. Mitchell Carlton Sims was raised in Columbia, South Carolina, as the youngest of three children. What we learned in talking to the family was he had come from a broken home. He apparently grew up in relatively humble beginnings. There may have been some abuse in his life. At 18, he had enlisted in the Army, but he was forced to leave after only two years. He had been dishonorably discharged after an incident there when he tried to frame a fellow soldier for shooting him. He got involved with the wife of a military officer and came up with some kind of a plan where one of his buddies was going to shoot Mitchell and then, hopefully, the husband of this woman would get the blame, and then Mitchell and she could be together. Now, this was a harebrained scheme that the authorities quickly saw through. The only person that was really hurt was Mitchell, because he actually was shot in the leg by his friend. And then the military, through their investigation, they wound up charging him, and he did some time at Fort Leavenworth. When he got out of prison in 1980, Mitch was 20 years old. He returned to Columbia, where he married a childhood friend, Teresa. She was only 16 at the time, but she seemed to be the more mature of the two. They wound up having three kids together. She kept him pretty well balanced, and she was a very nice lady. In January of 1985, Mitch started working as a manager at a Domino's Pizza in Columbia. On the surface, it appeared as though he was actually getting some level of success. Then he was highly regarded and was doing very well. And then there was a dispute about the low pay. And apparently had a falling out with his boss and had his bonus cut. He was upset. Instead of moving on, Mitchell had apparently decided to fight back. 
When he didn't get the bonus he felt he was entitled to, he tried to stage a coup with the other employees and get everyone to resign in protest. He became involved in a strike against the company, but his co-workers did not join him, and so he was very bitter about that. In May of that year, Mitchell even sent a formal complaint to corporate headquarters, but he never got a response and ultimately quit his job. He was upset the way he was treated. He was disgruntled. He did a series of odd jobs after that, but he could never make enough money to pay all the bills for the wife and the three kids, and she was very unhappy about that. It put a lot of stress on the marriage, and it led to Mitch having an affair with a young woman he met during the strike. The young woman's name was Ruby Paget. She's only 18 or 19 years old. I just sort of saw her as a person that was crying out for some love and some attention. She came from a terrible background, and she'd run away from home and worked various low-level jobs and done a lot of drinking and drugging. And there were two lost souls that came together. Mitchell ultimately left his wife and children to be with Ruby. They moved into a trailer together in North Charleston. He was drinking more and more, and he was involved with uh, Ruby, who liked to drink and do marijuana and speed or whatever else she could get her hands on, and so Mitchell joined her in that. Ruby wasn't working, so Mitch had to support her too, and it didn't seem like she was all that happy with his effort. What a little income that he could earn was squandered on alcohol and drugs. In November of 1985, Mitchell swallowed his pride and applied for a job at a different Domino's franchise, this time in Hanahan, South Carolina. But after only two weeks, it already wasn't going well. They'd given him a part-time job delivering pizzas, but a couple of weeks after he started, his truck broke down and he couldn't afford to fix it, which means he couldn't deliver pizzas. He was basically worse off than when he started. Considering Mitchell's history, it's not difficult to believe the setback could have driven him to commit armed robbery. That was his way of getting money. He knew how the system operated. He knows where the cash is kept. This is all because of his bruised ego over not getting a bonus. Coming up, investigators' search for their suspect becomes a nationwide manhunt. He went on a crime spree, and he wanted to get revenge. He had a hunger to kill. South Carolina police are looking for 25-year-old Mitchell Sims, who has been accused of murdering one co-worker and leaving another fighting for his life after an armed robbery. He already had the money when he shot them both execution style and close range in the head. It was very gruesome. From talking to family members, they know that he's living in a trailer with his 20-year-old girlfriend, Ruby Paget. They just don't know where she fits into all this yet. Investigators obtained the couple's address from Mitchell's job application. We then met with North Charleston Police Department because the residence was in their jurisdiction. And we went over there, but we couldn't locate exactly which mobile home he lived in. We got a search warrant for it. And we went back over there the next morning, and that's when we found out which one he lived in. But when officers enter the trailer, they quickly realize that they're too late. During that time gap, Mitchell Sims and Ruby Padgett, they were able to escape. We had an officer to go to the airport and check with all the airlines there. We had an officer go to the bus station. We were checking all the motels in the area. It was all over the police radios. The police told us Mitch Sims' name as soon as they found out because they needed the media's help to spread the word. They did give a picture out to all the local TV stations just in case they're still in the area. We ultimately developed some information that he might have taken a bus out of Charleston. And that's when we got with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and they sent a couple agents out to work with us. While the manhunt expands, investigators receive another piece of bad news. Following surgery, Gary fell into a coma and never woke up. He died less than a week after the shooting. After everything he had been through, that was heartbreaking. Unfortunately, it also meant police wouldn't have his testimony, and that was their only evidence at that point. With no witness and no leads, the case seems to be getting colder with each passing day. Until December 10th, 
A week after the armed robbery in Hanahan, South Carolina, police 2,500 miles away in Glendale, California, get a surprising call. A young man named Richard Wagner says he has information about a robbery that happened at a pizza store in Glendale. Richard Wagner walked in just to visit his coworkers because he also works there, but he was off duty that night and saw this individual who he didn't know. Richard says the stranger came out of the back wearing an employee's shirt and answered the phone as if he worked there. Something about it felt immediately off to him. Nobody in the store was acting the way they normally would. His friends who were working there treated him strangely as if they didn't know him, so he quickly became suspicious. He also saw him smoking a cigarette, which was a no-no um, under company policy. Richard called his boss at a payphone. He agreed to meet Richard at the store to find out what's going on. But when they got there, they couldn't see anyone at all. They immediately called police. Officers arrive within minutes. At first glance, the store appears to be empty. But when they open the walk-in cooler, they make a gruesome discovery. There were two employees inside hanging from storage racks. They were standing on boxes and gasping for breath. It seemed like a really grotesque form of torture. They were tied with their hands behind their back, with the rope going over a rack in the other end around their neck. They were having a great deal of trouble staying up off their toes so that they wouldn't choke to death. Police quickly cut them down. The two victims turn out to be 41-year-old delivery driver Ed Sycam and 19-year-old assistant manager Corey Spiroff. They gave us uh, jackets and, and blankets or whatever else they had to try to uh, try to warm us up. They immediately started the questioning of just, what's the story, what happened? Corey tells them that Ed stayed behind to help him close up for the night. Another employee, John Harrigan, was out making his last delivery. I had already pulled the cash and I was making up my bank deposits. I heard someone come into the store. Corey goes out front thinking it's John, but instead he finds two customers, a man with dark hair and a skinny blonde woman. Corey tells police that before he could even say they were closed, the man pulled out a gun. My whole being was sucked right into that uh, barrel. Very calm, he just said, go back in the office. Ed was standing just in the, just off to the side, and he saw what was going on. He was instructed to come over, and we both uh, went into the office. She had a long butcher knife. She was the one who was basically collecting the money, so I was giving the money to her. This was probably the perfect time for them to approach and rob us. It was the very end of the night. We were minutes from closing. We would have already begun to accumulate any, any cash or monies in the store uh, to make the bank deposits. Corey says he warned the couple that their delivery driver would be returning soon, but they didn't seem to care. I said, if you hear someone come running in the door, don't, don't panic. He's due back any moment now. Corey said the man just took off his sweater and showed him what he had on underneath it. It was a pizza delivery uniform with John's name on it. He sort of laughed and said, no, I don't think so. It was alarming. A whole bunch of thoughts go through your head on, on you know, what happened. Uh, where's John? Once the robbers collected all the money, they told Corey and Ed to both face the wall. The wall, he had the gun up, extended out, and I was certain at that point that that, that was when he was going to kill us. But at that exact moment, they hear someone come into the store. At that very moment, someone called out, hey, is there anybody here? So I looked back at him and, and said, well, you know, what do you want me to do? And he, he put the gun on my head and said, don't do anything stupid. I'm going to blow this guy away. Coming up, another victim with a familiar M.O. The taking and killing of the employee, and then the way he tied the other employees up. He knew the ins and outs of the pizza operation. Manager Corey Spiroff is telling Glendale police the harrowing story of a couple who robbed his pizza store at gunpoint. Corey believes the man was just about to kill him and his employee when they were interrupted. Someone calls out from the front of the store, so he sends Corey to go deal with it while he holds Ed hostage. He gets out there and immediately recognizes his coworker, Richard Wagner, but he doesn't want him to get pulled into this too, so he plays it off like he doesn't know him. I didn't acknowledge 
that I knew him. He sort of looked at me funny, didn't say anything outright, but he, he was trying to get my attention. And I continued to, to look down. I didn't acknowledge him. I asked him again, what would you like to order? Luckily, Richard played along. While Corey is taking Richard's order, the phone rings. At this point, the robber comes out from the office. He can't chance the fact that Corey won't call out for help. He picked up the phone, answered, said, thank you for calling. This is Mitch. How can I help you? And proceeded to take an order for a delivery. Corey finishes ringing up Richard's pizza and tells him to go outside and wait in the car. He'll bring it out when it's done. But at that point, Richard has figured out what's going on, and he calls police. Corey says that's when the man calling himself Mitch decided to leave them in the walk-in cooler, and he'd come prepared with a rope. He said, uh, put your arms behind your back, and he took the, the end of the rope and looped it over the top of a uh, metal shelf and pulled that back down and tied off uh, uh, around my neck. During the process of being tied, uh, and you know, I was in first, he, he brought Ed in, tied him, and I, I believe Ed was uh, complaining a bit about you know, how tight it was or he was choking. The response very simply was, so at least you're alive. We didn't know what was next. You know, we didn't know if he was going to open the door and shoot us. Uh, we, didn't know, uh, we didn't know what was going to happen at that point. If we came off of our toes, we'd strangle. No matter how you move, no matter what you do, you're in, you're in pain. Your legs, your ankles, your calves are, are, are hurting, screaming. It's cold. It's probably 35 degrees in the cooler. By this time, we're bound, so we've got a loss of circulation. We've been in the cold for, for a while. So your fingers just don't, don't even really work that well. They couldn't, they were too cold. They would have died there, but for the fact that police were on their way. In fact, it was Richard Wagner's quick action that saved their lives. Corey is thankful that he and Ed survived, but he's worried about what Mitch might have done to his other driver. Corey told the police that John Harrigan had gone to make a delivery and had never come back and that the person who robbed them had returned wearing Harrigan's shirt and name badge. I asked him, where's John? What happened with John? He said, they'll find him after they find you. Corey gave police the address for the last delivery, which was a motel not far from the store. When they get there, no one answers the door, so they get the manager to let them in. The first thing they notice is the sound of water running in the bathroom. Inside. Police find the dead body of a man submerged in the tub. He's been hogtied and gagged with a pillowcase over his head. When homicide investigators get there, they notice the rope used to hogtie the victim is the same kind used on Ed and Corey, but it's still unclear if he died of strangulation or drowning. The victim is identified as 21-year-old John Harrigan. They robbed him of his pizza money, of his truck, his keys, and even his clothing. Young man like that, that he would end up drowned in the bathtub over delivering a pizza. How could someone do that? 30 minutes or more uh, after the, the officers had gone to the motel to, to get John, a couple of them came back and they, they said, uh, there's been a homicide. It was devastating. It was, uh, I, I couldn't believe it. It sort of hits you like a ton of bricks. And when Glendale police contact the company's corporate office, they discovered that the suspects might also be connected to another case, a double homicide that occurred 2,500 miles away at their store in Hanahan, South Carolina, just one week earlier. The two departments get together to compare notes, and the similarities between the two crimes are undeniable. They're also very good evidence of modus operandi. It's the same motive for both murders. And Sim said on the phone, this is Mitch. So that was another clue right there. Investigative teams tear that motel room apart. They eventually find one conclusive piece of evidence that ties the murders together. It had very clearly been cleaned of any forensic evidence, but they did find one fingerprint on the inside of a toilet paper roll that matched to Mitchell Sims. Once police have a suspect, they contact Corey Spiroff to identify him. We learned probably in the next day or two that police contacted us and said, you know, something similar happened a week ago in South Carolina. We have some potential suspects, and we'd like you to look at some pictures. Six or eight pictures on a page. You know, as soon as they opened up that book and showed those pictures, I mean, it was him first. He jumped right off the page. There was no question, no doubt, that that was the individual. Investigators are no longer looking for armed robbers. They're on the hunt for a pair of serial killers. 
Both states have had innocent citizens cut down in the prime of their lives. There's no question that Mitchell Sims committed these horrible crimes. This wasn't about robberies. This was about making employees suffer. The way that he killed them was, in fact, torture. John Harrigan's delivery truck is missing from the scene, and it looks like Mitch and Ruby may have taken it to flee the scene. California police immediately issue a nationwide alert for the missing truck and the couple. The FBI had already put his picture on all of the TV channels throughout America. And then they even got bigger, and he was getting ready to be put on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Coming up, investigators receive an anonymous tip, but can they catch the fugitives before they strike again? The media had a field day with this case. They were like a modern-day Bonnie and Clyde. Investigators from multiple law enforcement agencies around the United States are working around the clock to locate two suspected murderers, 25-year-old Mitchell Sims and his 20-year-old girlfriend, Ruby Paget. It got a lot of attention from the press at the time. It was a sensational case. It was all over the news, all over the newspapers, the TV, the radio. It became interesting because, number one, there were, there were multiple killings, and secondly, involved a national corporation. The corporation took a very keen interest in this. To assist in the search, Domino's Pizza offers up a $100,000 reward for any information leading to their capture. I understood that this is a company that believes in its people, takes care of its people. They really stepped up with a substantial reward for the capture of these individuals. I think they recognize that we need to bring to justice whoever is killing our, our innocent employees. Nobody knew where they were. So there was real concern in the company, for sure, that uh, it might happen again. Ten days later, on December 21st, officers in Las Vegas, Nevada, find an abandoned truck in a casino parking lot. They run the plates and discover it's John Harrigan's missing truck. It had been wiped down, just like the motel room. But inside, they found John's uniform and his name tag. So that tipped the police off to their general location. Investigators immediately shift all the media attention to the Las Vegas area. His photo was on television, on the news. There had been a media blitz about the pizza killers being in Las Vegas area. It doesn't take long for the move to pay off. Just before midnight on Christmas Eve, police receive an anonymous tip that Mitch and Ruby are holed up in a motel nearby. I went out there and checked with the clerk, and when I described him and he had seen the photo on television, he says, well, yeah, it could be him. It's around 2 a.m., and Las Vegas police surround the motel. If it is Mitch, they don't know how he's going to react. They don't know if he's going to go out in a blaze of glory. We went in, naturally, at gunpoint because he was allegedly armed and dangerous. I had one officer out back and one in front. So we walked up to the door and got beside it. I knocked at the door. The officers are ready for anything, but thankfully, the encounter doesn't end in violence. The door open and Mitch just puts his hands up, Ruby sitting on the bed behind him. He was very serene. I mean, he didn't say anything. She was basically the same way. It probably went down as easy as the easiest arrest I ever made. I was kind of uh, surprised at that. I think they realized that they were completely outnumbered and the, there was all this firepower and automatic weapons facing them. When they started checking and doing a search room, they looked under the mattress and there was the gun. They still had the murder weapon in their possession as well as the cash bag from the robbery in Glendale. Almost three weeks after the first domino shooting, the suspects are finally in custody. But despite the couple's timid behavior, police discover evidence that their crime spree had been far from over. On a table by the bed, they'd noticed some pages torn out of a phone book, and they'd circle some pizza places in the area like they were planning their next robbery. Oh, it's 100% they were going to commit more murders. Investigators are quick to notify surviving victims of the arrest. A few days after I had made the identifications, I then went back to Michigan for, uh, for Christmas, and it was... Christmas Day, the phone rang, and uh, 
It was uh, uh, someone telling me that, that he'd been captured in Las Vegas. Mitchell Sims and Ruby Padgett are immediately brought in for questioning. While Mitch remains tight-lipped, Ruby decides to tell investigators everything. She has no problem throwing her boyfriend under the bus. She says it was all his idea and goes into great detail about how he killed John Harrigan. Sims and Padgett started the day by casing the store in Glendale. They then went to a store where they bought rope and a knife. That night, at their hotel room, they ordered pizza to be delivered to the room, but it was a trap from the beginning. As soon as John Harrigan walked into that motel room, Mitch attacked him. He kneed him in the stomach and then robbed him at gunpoint. This young man didn't resist at all. He was compliant. Ruby says Mitch didn't want to shoot John because of the noise, so he decided to tie him up instead. They wanted to leave him at the motel, but the plan got more complicated as time went on. Sims shoved a sock in his mouth and then tied a rag around that sock so he could barely breathe. They filled the tub with water and dumped Harrigan inside it. He never had a chance. I think Mitchell kind of panicked in the sense that the reason that he was fingered in the South Carolina homicides was that there was a surviving victim. She claimed Mitch held Harrigan's head under the water until he was sure he was dead. They then went back to the pizza store and robbed it. Ruby Padgett never took any responsibility for the murder. She said she just went along for the ride and basically blamed Sims. The witnesses, however, don't see it that way. She was a knowing participant. She was actively involved. You know, I think the two of them were, uh, they fed off each other very much. I think one made the other worse and vice versa. The couple are charged with multiple crimes in two different states. But can prosecutors convince a jury to convict them both? Coming up, Mitchell Sims and Ruby Padgett stand trial for murder. To me, the fact cried out literally for the death penalty. After a month-long manhunt, Mitchell Sims and Ruby Padgett have finally been arrested in Las Vegas, Nevada. Although their crime spree began in South Carolina, prosecutors ultimately decide to begin with the case in Glendale, California. We wanted them to come back here immediately because uh, the, he, the first killing was here. However, uh, California had a better case against Ruby than we had. Ruby Padgett was not on the radar for anything. She wasn't involved in the South Carolina murders to anyone's knowledge. So she really came on the radar when she was involved with the Glendale murder and attempted murders. The charges were three counts of armed robbery, two counts of attempted murder, and one count of first degree murder with special circumstances. If convicted, Ruby faces life in prison and Mitchell could get the death penalty. The prosecution didn't seek death to her because the facts related to her involvement were very different than Sims' involvement. Lawyers representing the couple decide to separate them. Ruby is the first to stand trial in January of 1987. The 21-year-old pleads not guilty. Her defense was that she was in the motel room, but, you know, she did not uh, help Mr. Sims in any way. She had no idea he was going to do that. The prosecution theory at trial was that Padgett had to be an active participant because it would have been too difficult for Mitchell Sims alone to drag the hog-tied John Harrigan into the bathroom and lift him into the bathtub by himself. After six days of deliberation, the jury returns its verdict. They find her guilty of first-degree murder and armed robbery but she is acquitted on the two counts of attempted murder. Clearly, Ruby Padgett was not the leader in this escapade. Sims was the one who was the former employee who held the grudge. I think the jury uh, felt some sympathy for her, and instead of giving her the death penalty, they gave her life in prison without the possibility of parole. On March 10th, 1987, Mitchell Sims' trial begins. The prosecution described him as an angry and violent man who was out seeking revenge, but once he started killing people, he got a taste for it. It 
is indicative of Mitchell Sims feeling like he's the aggrieved person. He's been wrong, and the way for him to regain his power is to make other people the victims. Mitchell's attorneys don't attempt to prove his innocence. Instead, they focus on removing the death penalty. The special circumstances of Harrigan's murder was the plan to lure him into a trap, but they claim that wasn't the case. They were arguing it was an accident, that they didn't tie him up in such a way that he couldn't get himself out if he wanted to. And while the autopsy listed strangulation as the cause of death, drowning could not be ruled out as an additional cause. The defense theory was that there was no intent to kill John Harrigan, that John Harrigan died accidentally when he struck his head in the bathtub and fell unconscious in the water that was running. But it was a preposterous defense. The jury doesn't believe it either. That was ridiculous because he had a ligature mark in his neck deep enough that he was probably already passed out. I didn't have any doubt. I knew he did it. On May 20th, 1987, Mitchell Sims is found guilty on all charges. At sentencing, Mitch's lawyers tried to argue that he shouldn't be completely held responsible for his crimes because of a history of childhood abuse. Mitchell Sims' family background was one of the most horrific that I've encountered in my entire career as a forensic psychiatrist. There was, by his stepfather, verbal abuse, physical abuse, which were beatings uh, of Mitchell with his fists. The defense claims that when Mitchell was seven years old, his now deceased stepfather also began sexually abusing him. This occurred over a prolonged period of time, and as a result, Mitchell became so traumatized and reclusive that he oftentimes just sat staring into space. It had apparently gotten worse over time. They claimed that Mitch's stepfather had apparently forced him to have sex with one of his sisters and his mother. We heard the testimony about Sims and his horrible childhood. It was one of the worst I've heard. If there was any disagreement between jurors, it was during the penalty phase. But in the end, the jury's decision was unanimous. They voted for the death penalty, and at that time in California, that meant the gas chamber. My thought process was, he killed John Harrigan. He was 21 years old. He was just starting his life. But on top of that, he had brothers and sisters who didn't kill anybody. I was there when the, the death sentence was handed down. For me, it was very much a relief. It was a closing chapter. On, uh, on this whole thing. Mitch is then tried in South Carolina for the murders of Chris Zare and Gary Melke. The results are the same. I've been around a lot of people who've been guilty of murder. He was very callous. I've never seen somebody so cold. The jury deliberated for only six hours before finding him guilty. That resulted in a second death penalty. But no punishment could ever help the families of the victims make sense of their loss. What started as a bitter man's need for revenge had escalated into a murder spree that devastated countless lives. A lot of people, they have problems with the jobs. They get cheated out of a bonus. They quit their jobs and move on. Mitchell Sims didn't do that. He decided to take out his vengeance. I still remember it, and I still remember the incredible loss that occurred with just outstanding individuals and the tremendous horrible ramifications that it had with their families. Had Melky not survived the shooting and if he wasn't able to tell the cops that Mitchell Sims did it, who knows how many more murders Sims would have committed across the entire country. liked in the community and at work. He was like the office stud. The relationship was progressing. Maybe this is meant to be. But this office romance wouldn't have a fairy tale ending. There's bloody handprints on the walls. There's blood smeared on the floor. The violence was so over the top that it had to have some personal connection. 
The ensuing investigation would reveal that Mr. Wright wasn't as perfect as he appeared to be. And someone had decided to make him pay for it. And I was like, is there a female serial killer? What's going on here? The person who committed this murder had a score to settle. They chose violence. Bloody, bloody violence. Friday, November 8, 2002. It's a quiet afternoon in the picturesque harbor area of Stamford, Connecticut. Until 12.13 p.m., when local police receive a disturbing 911 call. Stamford, please. Hello? Hello? I a guy is, is attacked my neighbor. I saw a guy go into her apartment. The 911 dispatch asks her, what is your neighbor's name? She doesn't know her name, but what she does know is the number of the door. I don't know her name, but the guy was this. There in the top. I heard yelling. I heard yelling. Okay. What are you don't know your hello? Hello? The call cuts off abruptly at that point. They don't know if she hung up, got disconnected, or if she could be in danger as well. Officers are immediately dispatched to the apartment identified by the caller. This is a upper level condominium on the waterfront they have docks there it's a, a very nice neighborhood so you're not prepared for what you're going to see when you open that door they enter the apartment and find the body of a dead woman inside the victim was lying just inside the threshold of the door and there was a tremendous amount of blood we felt that definitely a stabbing was involved we could look at the victim and even without additional information from the medical examiner, you could see a number of stab wounds about the chest and neck area. The officers quickly secure the area and call for backup. Considering the location, they knew this was going to be a high-profile case. When I first got down there, uh, there was a lot of police, and the area was taped off, and it was hard to get information. Police weren't giving anything, but I do remember a source of mine slipping me a note by the next morning, the victim's face is all over the news. She is a beautiful 32-year-old research scientist named Anna Lisa Raimondo. Anna Lisa Raimondo was born to Filipino parents who immigrated into this country. Wonderful people. Her father was a doctor. Mother was a professional. She was just a go-getter came from a family with very high standards. And I think not only did they want the best for her, but she fought to have the best for herself. Attended Harvard, attended Columbia for graduate school, you know, and just kind of the apple of her parents' eye. After finishing her degrees, Anna Lisa could have pursued a career anywhere in the country, but she decided to stay in Connecticut. She had her pick. And she chose to go into pharmaceutical research and she was one of the best at her job. She worked at Purdue Pharma, this big company, right downtown Stanford. She wanted to help people and make the world a better place, but pharmaceuticals are also big business. By her late 20s, she had made enough money to buy herself a condo in Chapon. She was just climbing the ranks and making a wonderful life for herself. Annalise's devotion to her job left little time for relationships. So it wasn't surprising that she fell in love with a coworker. So while uh, working at Purdue Pharma, she met a man by the name of Nelson Sessler, who worked there as well. He was tall, handsome, and he was like the office stud, and everybody had a crush on him. They started out as friends and then began dating casually at first. But by the summer of 2002, the romance between Annalisa and Nelson had become more serious. The relationship was progressing. He was spending the night quite a bit at her condo. Employees definitely knew them as a couple. When there was a work function, they were together. They went out together. They did dinners together. They're making good money, and everything appeared that it was a good relationship. For Annalisa, I mean, she really felt like this was going to be her husband, like they were going to get married. 
but the couple's plans for the future would never be realized. 32-year-old Annalisa has been found murdered in her waterfront condominium, and the entire community wants to know why. Leading the investigation into this high-pressure case is Captain Richard Conklin. The minute you enter that apartment, the crime scene is all there. Different items that had been knocked about. One of the more bloody scenes I had ever seen. One of the first things they want to do is find the 911 caller. She had hung up so abruptly, you know they had to be thinking the worst, that maybe she was a victim as well. Someone called 911, and that person who called 911 said they were a neighbor. Who is it? Well, what happens is, when they begin to send out other investigators and start looking at tracing the call, what they find is kind of strange. When we find that the call came from a payphone about a half mile from this crime scene. If this caller's life is in danger, it would make sense for her to get away and call from someplace safe. But if she had done so, why didn't she just say that? They alleged that they were a witness to this disturbance. And, uh, you know, these are the things that were racing through our mind. You know, why didn't this person identify themselves? I think there were some red flags that immediately went up at that point. Immediately, we had to come up to speed very quickly. Who was this victim? What were we dealing with? Who might have done this to her? Coming up, crime scene investigation reveals clues about the killer. Stabbing someone is a crime of passion. You have to have some real deep feelings to kill someone that maliciously. Under intense media scrutiny, Connecticut police have begun an investigation into the murder of 32-year-old research scientist, Anna Lisa Raimundo. We're knocking on doors, uh, you know, we're doing computerized checks as to that residence. Has there been different disturbance calls there? Have they called for police services prior? All these are going on at one time and very, very rapidly. Mind you, this is still early in the afternoon on a work day, so many of her neighbors weren't home. The few that were home reported hearing nothing. The 911 call has been traced to a nearby payphone, but the caller's identity is still unknown. We send people to process this area. Uh, at that time, they didn't have security cameras trained on that outside payphone. It's uh, difficult to get straight up fingerprints off of it because there's so many people handling these payphones back at that point. Police canvassed the other businesses in the area, hoping someone saw the caller, but they come up empty handed. Meanwhile, a team of forensic specialists is busy processing the condominium for evidence. I can't really describe how frantic you are in the beginning of a high-level homicide like this and the number of tasks you're undertaking at one time. Soon after seeing this scene, I, I made a decision, and it's one I've only made a couple times in my entire career. We decided to call in the state police major crime unit. DNA was just starting to be a wonderful tool for law enforcement. And when we saw what a bloody crime scene this was. We really wanted to preserve the scene. And you only get one chance, one shot, at processing a crime scene. If you don't do it well, you lose the evidence. What they would have seen standing from the foyer, basically, is a female victim who appears to be 25 to 35. Long black hair, kind of lying on the ground there's bloody handprints on the walls, and there's, there's blood smeared on the floor. There was no forced entry. The lock was in, in good shape. Uh, it hadn't been tampered with. So you have to think that perhaps someone knocked or rang the doorbell, and our victim answered the door, and then either allowed someone entry or someone kind of pushed their way through at that point. And then it looked like just it immediately, a life and death struggle took place. Annalisa's injuries provide a terrifying summary of the attack. 
There was a very violent struggle. There was glass broken. Annalisa was smashed over the head with an object and also stabbed several times in the face and neck, chest. Stabbing someone is a crime of passion. You have to be angry with someone or have some real deep feelings to kill someone that maliciously. And she was stabbed nine times. The dumbbell on the ground has hair and it has blood on it. So they know that that dumbbell was used in this crime in some way. Annalisa's skull had been fractured by a heavy blow and she had been stabbed a total of nine times to the face, neck, and chest. One of the stab wounds had even reached the back of her lung. Thankfully, there was no sign of sexual assault. No, this was a prolonged attack, but whatever edged knife or weapon was used was not left at the scene. We could not locate that in that area. Further inspection also reveals a trail of blood leading away from the body. You can see bloody footprints and smudges going all the way to the bathroom. So for investigators, that bathroom becomes a focal point. There was some blood, a droplet of blood, as they described it, on the sink handle in the bathroom there uh, near the entryway. We kind of felt that someone might have washed up there because it would be odd, you know, to find that blood on that fixture like that. Police are hopeful the DNA will help identify Annalisa's killer. But what prompted the attack? You make some assessments as you're going along. Could someone had uh, attempted to burglarize this location and didn't realize that she was home? But as we look through the apartment, there's so many valuables left around. Uh, the place isn't ransacked. There's silverware, there's computers, their TVs, there's still money in her pocketbook. I felt that the violence was so over the top that it almost had to have some personal connection to it. And police quickly learned there was no one closer to Annalisa than her boyfriend, Nelson. We started contacting friends and family. We were talking to neighbors, and we were able to make that she was in a relationship with uh, Nelson Sessler. Uh, so immediately, that's put on our to-do list. Coming up, a loving boyfriend or a cold-blooded killer? I've seen people on scenes drop to their knees, screaming and crying in disbelief that someone is dead. Why is this guy not completely distraught? Hours after finding Annalisa Raimundo murdered in her luxury condominium, investigators have a potential suspect, her boyfriend, Nelson Sessler. You're looking at domestic partners, especially such a violent crime like this, and you realize that you want to make contact immediately because such a violent, a bloody crime scene, there's no way that there wasn't transfer of blood to the attacker. But before officers can even begin searching for him, Nelson unexpectedly shows up at the crime scene. Up pulls this guy, and he wants to know what's going on in that condominium. Why do you want to know? That's my girlfriend slash fiance in there. There was, you know, no bloody clothing, uh, no scratch marks on his face. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything. They know the killer used the bathroom sink to wash the blood off. So now they're really interested to see what Nelson has to say. He said they were already engaged or they were about to get engaged, but they were definitely becoming more serious, and they were talking about marriage, and they had a very good relationship. They tell him, you know, that his fiance has been the victim of a homicide, and they were struck by his reaction. It wasn't a typical grief or grieving type of action. It was very emotionless. If I'm told my fiance was just murdered, I'm gonna lose it. Nelson doesn't shed a tear. He kind of bows his head a little bit and sits there, and he's kind of like, oh, geez, golly, I can't believe this happened. Despite his strange reaction, Nelson denies having anything to do with Annalisa's death. According to Nelson, the last time he saw her was the morning he was leaving for work. 
He said they'd made plans to get together again that night. She moved to another company in New Jersey. She was working from home a lot, traveling back and forth to New Jersey. He and Annalisa were supposed to go into the city to have drinks with a friend from Purdue Pharma. While police try to verify Nelson's story, his attitude does little to reduce their suspicions. They want to keep this guy contained. So they keep him in this lounge. And as they're going through the crime scene, they come back to him. He's sleeping. This guy was so laid back. Yeah, my girlfriend was just killed, but I'm going to go take a nap. They ask him for a DNA sample, which he voluntarily gives up, but the way he's acting is sending all kinds of red flags. But when investigators contact the pharmaceutical company, they confirm his alibi. The good thing about Purdue Pharma is they have a very extensive security system with cameras and a badge type of check-in. They were able to look at that time frame when this murder happened and see that Nelson was indeed at work, as he said. He had a very rock-solid alibi at that point that he was not the killer. With Nelson no longer a suspect, detectives turned their attention back to the missing female 911 caller. They asked Nelson if there were any women that he could think of that would want to hurt Annalisa. No one immediately comes to mind, but he does give police the name of two former girlfriends who both suffered from depression. Investigators quickly rule out both women, as well as the rest of Annalisa's family. They weren't anywhere near the condo at the time of the murder, and they didn't have a motive. But police did take a DNA sample just in case. We're doing uh, meticulous work, but we really don't have anything that we're really locked into. You start to look at, well, what's going on in this area of the condominium? Well, one thing they find out is a lot of the yachts parked there there are burgled. And they start looking at some of the people arrested for those crimes. Anyone that was arrested in the city of Stanford was being debriefed. Do they know anything about this? There was a great deal of frustration that we weren't making great headway in this investigation. Detectives' best hope for a lead comes from the DNA tests performed on the blood found in Annalisa's bathroom. The DNA hit comes back on a mixture of both our victim and another person's uh, DNA. And again, you start looking for elimination, like you look for elimination fingerprints. They compared that sample to the exemplars they had with everyone they had talked to so far. As suspected, it didn't match Nelson or the victim's family. They submit that blood into CODIS, into all the systems, but comes up negative. If that person hadn't been arrested before, it's not going to pop up. It would either give a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down to any suspects that we developed later in this investigation. So it was certainly something we were very happy about and hopeful. But when months go by without any new developments in the case, those hopes begin to wane. There is no one left to interview at this point, and they still need more information on this mysterious 911 caller. It's like the investigation just comes to a halt at this point. You're just waiting for something to come in. It eats you up inside because you want answers for the family. You want justice. Coming up, news of another stabbing provides investigators with the break they've been looking for. And I was like, is there a female serial killer? Or what, you know, what's going on here? After five months of investigation into the murder of Annalisa Raimundo, Connecticut police seem to have reached a dead end. But on March 23, 2003, an incident in nearby New York changes that. I remember I came in the office and my editor was saying, you need to look into this. There was a stabbing in Westchester County and someone called and said they think it's related to Annalisa's death. Westchester Medical Center. Sunday night, some hospital employees were out on their break, and they hear a scuffle in the uh, car park. It's dark, and they can't be sure what they're seeing, but it appears to be a man and a woman who are engaged in a physical altercation. 
A security guard intervened, separated the two, and they called the police. The man was bleeding heavily from three stab wounds to the chest. Luckily, they were right outside of an emergency room, and he was able to be treated immediately. They got the suspect, who was the wife, in, and the Westchester authorities started questioning her. Uh, you know, they felt that they had an attempt at murder here. The victim's name is Paul Christos. His wife is 33-year-old Sheila Davalu. Sheila tells investigators that she and Paul had met as fellow students at New York Medical College in 1994, before getting married in May of 2000. They were rising up the ranks of their careers in college, getting master's degrees, doctorates, and they were good together. Sheila claims they have it all wrong. She was trying to help her husband, not hurt him. What time was it when he came home? I didn't notice him at first. I was playing with the dog, and then he came and he said he was hurt, and he laid on he laid on the floor, and he's like, "Can you look at it, Steve? It's bleeding." I saw I saw the wounds in his chest. So was it was there blood around his body? There's definitely a lot of blood. Sheila claims they decided it would take too long for an ambulance to arrive, so she drove Paul to the hospital. If she and Paul weren't fighting in the parking lot, then what were they doing when the security guard had to separate them? And why did she take the time to park the car at all? Sheila, I have to be honest with you. I found it off. The whole thing, thing is odd. Meanwhile, doctors have stabilized Paul's condition. The first thing he does is ask to speak to police. Paul Christos is a strong guy. I mean, here's a guy who was stabbed three times, punctured lung, bled profusely, but he's talking. He wants to tell his story. Their marriage had not uh, apparently been doing well for a while. Um, you know, they were both academics, and, but they were kind of living separate lives. He was continuing on with school. She had this career. Paul says that when he came home earlier that day, Sheila suggested they try something new to reignite their relationship. He was still trying to work on this marriage, so when he's, you know, hearing, okay, we're going to play a sex game, he's, you know, all in for it. He describes some game he was playing with his wife, whereby they would blindfold each other and they would rub different objects on each other and the blindfolded person had to guess what the object was. He describes how he was blindfolded, tied to a chair, and his wife is rubbing objects on him, and all of a sudden he just feels this kind of thrust, this sharp pain in his chest. And he tells her, please, take the blindfold off. What's going on here? And he looks down and he sees blood. His wife says, oh, it was a candle, and there must have been some piece of metal sticking out of the bottom of the candle, and it m cut you or something. He buys that, I guess. Paul's still in love with Sheila, and I think the fact that he's willing to still believe her despite how badly he's injured is a testament to that. He's like, okay, but I'm kind of losing blood and I'm, I'm getting dizzy. Call 911. He's in the chair listening to his wife as she describes, my husband is hurt, he's bleeding, and we need an ambulance here. They wait. Paul says they waited for what seemed like a very long time, but the ambulance never showed up. He begs his wife, put me in the car, take me to the ER. He's in the back seat. She pulls into the hospital park a lot and pulls around back. He's like, what's going on? She gets out of the car, comes over, opens the passenger door in the back. She has a knife in her hand. She begins to attack him. She stabs him again, and thank goodness those hospital employees were out there and heard what was going on. Now he knows something. He knows it wasn't a candle. His wife blindfolded him, strapped him to a chair, and then stabbed him. Investigators confront Sheila with her husband's testimony, but she denies trying to kill him. She admits to using a knife in their sex game, but she insists that she never meant to hurt Paul. Somebody's just by accident. Paul said he would stay again. On the way to the hospital. 
But when detectives search the hospital parking lot, they find two damning pieces of evidence. They find a bloody kitchen knife and Sheila's cell phone, which she dropped during the struggle. When they search her call history, it's easy to see she's been lying to them. Sheila Davlu never called 911 for an ambulance. She never dialed the number. Instead, she called someone else in Stanford, and there were voicemails from that same number in return. It's a guy who is traveling down to Westchester County in order to meet Sheila that night for dinner and spend the weekend. So it's clear that she has a lover, and that man's name is Nelson Sessler. Coming up, detectives in New York and Connecticut join forces to solve the murder of Annalisa Raimondo. I think that he needed a shoulder to cry on, and so she kind of played into that. He was vulnerable. Police suspect 33-year-old Sheila Davalu tried to kill her husband and make it look like an accident. But they're about to discover she's also connected to a different stabbing. She's been arrested and charged in New York at this point, and they know she's been having an affair with a man named Nelson, and they want to find out if he's involved as well. So an investigator makes the 45-minute drive from Westchester to Stamford. She heads up to Stamford, Connecticut, knocks on the door to his apartment. No answer. Knocks again, no answer. A neighbor hears the commotion and comes outside, and they just want to know if they found who murdered Nelson's fiance yet. Well, what are you talking about, murder? And so she pieces together right there that there's a murder in Stanford, and now she has a man stabbed in Westchester County, and that somehow these could be connected. She immediately contacts the detectives investigating Annalisa's murder. Hours later, Nelson Sessler is brought in for more questioning. Whether he was complicit or not is something we needed to find out. You know, the, the oddity of this attack, the oddity and the timing of this phone call. Nelson says all three of them worked at Purdue Pharma together. He briefly dated Sheila before he met Annalisa, but it was pretty casual, and that's why he hadn't mentioned her before. Sheila and Nelson had started seeing each other in 2001 but the relationship wasn't exclusive. Nelson you know, was kind of casually dating Sheila Davalu at this point and starts to casually date Annalisa Ramunda. Until he got serious with Annalisa, and then that relationship ceased. Nelson claims he and Sheila had broken things off in 2002. He also admits that for the past two months, he had been seeing Sheila again, but claims the affair hadn't begun until two months after Annalisa was killed. He was trying to get over the death of Annalisa, and I think that he needed a shoulder to cry on, and so she kind of played into that. Nelson said that Sheila had reached out to him with a care package full of cookies and things like that. Then the next weekend, she invited him on a ski trip with some friends from work, but when he got there, it was just the two of them. Either he's really gullible or she's really smart, maybe a little bit of both, but he uh, you know, fell right into her trap and kind of rekindled their relationship. Nelson also claims he had no idea Sheila was married. She worked at Purdue Pharma in Stanford, Connecticut. The one thing Sheila didn't mention at Purdue Pharma was that she had a husband in Westchester County. She never told anyone about that. Nelson told police he had slept over her house several times, but he never saw any signs of anyone else living there. When investigators follow up with Sheila's husband, they find out why. He goes into a lazy story about her having supposedly a disabled brother who would come and visit for the weekend. Sheila says, if my brother finds out I'm married to you, he's gonna get really upset. He's very possessive that way. Paul felt sorry for her and for him. It's hard to believe, but he would clean out anything that would link him to the apartment, any pictures, clothes. He would go and stay with friends or in a hotel. Sheila would then have Nelson Sessler come over and sleep with him all weekend while Paul was at a hotel. In retrospect, it's easy for Paul to see his wife's deception, 
but he says it didn't stop there. Sheila, she had this whole story that she would tell Paul all the time, you know, about her friends at work, Melissa and Jack and Lisa, and uh, how it was a love triangle. She'd go home at night at the end of the day and say to Paul, I feel so bad for my friend Melissa. How can I help her? She's really put out. She's really heartbroken uh, because Jack is interested in this other woman. What do I do? Paul, at one point, had an interest in becoming an FBI agent. He had had some training and even some law enforcement equipment, like night vision goggles. He gave them to Sheila so she could help her friend. Of course, there is no friend. The relationship she's worried about is the one between Nelson and Annalisa. And it was at that time, really, when Sheila Davalu began stalking Nelson, using night vision goggles, following him. Once this came into focus, the level of it obsession that Sheila had with Nelson and the different means that she would pursue him, it really became apparent that she wanted to take out the competition. When you look back at it, it's absolutely frightening. Nelson has already been cleared of any involvement in Annalisa's murder, and it's now clear to Stamford police that Sheila had plenty of motive to kill Annalisa, but did she have the opportunity? We know Purdue Pharma has a wonderful security system and that she worked there on that day. Was she working at this time? What we see is Sheila Davalu taking a long lunch on the day that Annalisa Raimondo was murdered. And during the time that the 911 calls made. So here's the opportunity. We played the call for so many of her family and associates. And there were a number of them that said, that's absolutely Sheila. The only thing left is to tie her to the crime scene, and that's where the DNA comes in. They already have samples from Annalise's apartment, and if Sheila is a match, that's pretty much ballgame. The lab results come back with a conclusive match for Sheila's DNA. Now, in addition to the attempted murder of her husband, she is also charged with the murder of Annalisa Raimundo. Coming up, Sheila puts her defense in the hands of the only person she trusts, herself. She believes these grandiose thoughts of herself that I can talk my way out of this. Everybody's going to believe me. In February of 2004, Sheila Davalu faces trial in New York for the attempted murder of her husband, Paul Christos. Prosecutors not only have the weapon and the eyewitnesses at the hospital, they also have Paul's direct testimony. Paul was a very good witness. He was very forthcoming. The attack at the hospital kind of locked into his mind that this was an attempt on his life. He had these loving feelings for her, so it was very upsetting for him to, like, know that the woman he married tried to kill him. The jury was sympathetic towards Paul, and the evidence was very strong. Sheila was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to 25 years in prison. Sheila serves nearly 10 years of her sentence before she is finally tried for the murder of Annalisa Raimondo. There's no statute of limitations on homicide or murder. So we had all the time in the world. Sheila's second trial begins on January 24th, 2012. Connecticut prosecutors argue that Sheila murdered Annalisa for the same reason she tried to kill her husband. It was all about her obsession with Nelson Sessler. She wanted him more than anything, but the feeling was not mutual. I think Sheila saw it as a relationship, whereas Nelson saw it as someone to sleep with. The jealous rage comes into play. We spoke about the overkill on the assault, the number of stab wounds, the bludgeoning. In addition to her husband's testimony, the state also has strong evidence to support their case. If Sheila Davalu didn't murder Annalisa Raimondo, why is her blood in Annalisa Raimondo's condominium? And that 911 call comes back up. Sheila definitely attempted to disguise her voice in that call. As years went on, and we had the luxury of time in this case, the technology 
uh, exploded in voice recognition, and we had experts again look into it, and they say, yes, that's definitely her voice. So the question always asked is, why did Sheila Davalu call 911 and not just go back to work? She's an ultimate narcissist. She cannot help herself from thinking that she can put the pawns in place to get away with something. When the time comes for Sheila's defense, she surprises everyone by deciding to represent herself. For as smart as this woman is and the time she had spent studying, she just kind of fell flat on her face with the cross-examination. She seemed nervous. She seemed at many times like she didn't know where to go next with the questioning. The judge was very often uh, frustrated with the situation, overrule what she was saying. Her only hope was to try and discredit the evidence against her. She asked the jury if they thought her voice sounded anything like the one on the 911 tape. She also called the DNA results into question. She felt that it was a mistake or perhaps something that, uh, you know, we had orchestrated. She also tried to use the New York conviction as proof she was incapable of committing murder. If she were the one to kill Annalisa, then it stood to reason that she would have been able to finish the job with her own husband, especially since he was tied up and blindfolded. With Annalisa, there was rage. She went to her house, got in, there was a big struggle. You know, I think with Paul, it was like, you know, she had these mixed feelings. She's stabbing him, but yet she was helping him. She was stabbing him, but yet she was putting him in the car and taking him to the hospital. On February 10th, 2012, the jury announces their verdict. Sheila was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to an additional 50 years in prison. To hear that verdict and just a sense of, of relief and, you know, really feeling good for the family that, you know, in a bad situation, we had given them some amount of closure here. We had ascertained the truth in this investigation. A scorned lover's need for revenge had torn apart several lives and ended the future of a promising young woman. I have this vision in my head uh, of either the doorbell or a knock at the door and Annalisa looking through the peephole and seeing Sheila Davlo and kind of being quizzical like, well, that's odd, but recognize her and really feeling no threat. That's the sad part, that she opened the door for someone that she thought was a friend or, you know, someone that she knew and let them into her home. Sheila Davalu is really the ultimate narcissist. Still to this day, she'll tell you I had nothing to do with it. She even says, I will pray for Annalisa and her family. She's going to pray for the woman she murdered. That's a sociopath, and that's Sheila Davalu.
个西站马老板米妮，咱家村里大哥大吗？秋风兄弟啊，秋月啊，帮我喊个喇叭呗，快去喇叭。宾饭宾宾饭，你看哪来？喊个分区喇叭。